Hi, I'm Margo Bertaszewski, and I'm going to read a prose poem from this issue of Mameg Review. It's called Songs. A lamb, not lamb of God, my lamb, my crying all night, and I'm telling you my everything, friend. You have no name, dirty white fake curly fur, soft enough to clutch in my paws and get wet with my crying. Lamb, confidant, I hold in bed on the 12th floor, 96th Street, Manhattan, water tower silhouettes like top-hatted golems watching me through the open shade. I can't sleep. My mama's asleep in her room. My father's asleep in his room. My grandma died tonight. I tell you, lamb, my grandma's dead. It's long after dark. I tell you and tell you and tell you. Grandma with black hair unbraided down to her knees. Hair they chopped off when mama sent her to a nursing home in New Jersey, where she died at dusk. I'm telling you, lamb, my grandma is dead. All water towers watching me night. I'm 10, maybe I'm 11. Once my father cut off all my hair. My grandma, who has no down to her knees hair anymore, is in her bed in a nursing home in New Jersey and dead. I'm a woman now, not 10, not 11, no lamb. A woman of a certain age, aging badly, someone said, <laughs> aging solo in a foreign bed. Three times divorced, awake in the middle of a night when news says war is beheading is butchering again. There are dead limbs of God and no lambs of God. There will be too many. I'm telling my animal, telling my dead grandma, telling my now gone mama. Lost now once upon mine lamb. Remember when grandma died and I held you all night? Remember how I felt for my once curls, my father chopped off, fingers stroking your dirty white pelt and whispering dead? Remember how you hissed something back to me in the no nightingales, no sounds dark. What did you say, love lost animal of mine, just soft enough to hide in my arm crooked between neck and the breasts I hadn't grown yet? What did you say to push me through that night like a needle? Songs of war are on our steps now, not there, here, here in our heads, in our breasts on our steps. Everyone says so. Tomb steps, world steps, woman in her bed tonight steps, tell me. I didn't know they were slices from poems, like bits of skin. You told me, I am the tree that trembles and trembles. Told me a child who walked in bare branched woods with her mother finding a small dead thing on the ground, how it was a Thanksgiving then, and how she told her mother, I'll name it delicate. You told me the quieter you become, the more you are able to hear. Told me while I held my breath until the heart would stop. Told me poets could say such words, right? Lamb, tell me those again now and make me quiet, right? Because tonight has to be the quietest night of my whole life. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Margo. Our next reader is Annalise Zeiderfeld. Hi, I have a poem in Mare uh, 21. It's on page 38 called Once I Was a Mother. I'm very grateful to have it in the journal. This poem is called It's Not Just Babies. It's not just babies that you want to inhale their sweet scent can become acrid if given milk that crusts and sours. We forget the precious in between, shy smiles, belly laughs gone after a glimpse, lessening as tweens edge into teens. I don't wanna lose those moments. Him lingering in the hall, inquisitive still, our summer of adventure, my moniker for making good on never knowing when time's up. Before long, Evenings will come closed door, me outside. I won't be sad as he learns to live without me, speaking up for him, 
filling out his own voice. Tonight, reading together, his eyes catch on keep, a stop word, latched gate or strong tower, fortified for whatever comes next. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, uh, for that poem. So our next reader is Mary Bonina. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Marjorie, Jen, Cindy, for organizing this and for all the large effort that you put into Mom Egg. Um, and, you know, I think it's making its mark in the literary community, and that's just really wonderful to see. Um, I'm uh, happy to be reading with such a great group of writers tonight. Um, I don't have any publications coming up, but I have a reading at the Kettle Pond Writers Conference this week with Chen Chen, so I'm excited about that. Um, I'm going to be reading from um, my poem that's in 21. Um, it's called The Living Room. The living room. I knew my baby's hunger, reading his cry, different from others, tired, wet, bored, or sick with a cold. Alone with him, I drove off road and down a dirt path. I parked, unbuttoned my blouse, and only then did I realize where we were. In a cemetery, surrounded by granite headstones and potted flowers. Some dried up and frozen, others perky plastic, nothing flourishing on a cold winter day. But I was there, nursing my boy, a few months old, warmed by the car heater, the engine kept running until he was satisfied. And suddenly I remembered being a child learning loss, how I turned away passing cemeteries in the car. And walking, I crossed the street to the other side. I guess I thought it was a way to ward off death. I was a superstitious child, also innocent enough to think I had power to change the course of nature. Was this the wishful or magical thinking of a child who lived in fear after a classmate's mother died giving birth? I went to the wake in the family home, couldn't stop thinking after. My friend had to live in that house where the lifeless body of her mother was on display in the living room. I thought of this that day with my son in the car as I fed him that afternoon when life, the opposite scenario, was being played out in the cemetery. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our next reader is Robert Carr. Thank you, Jen. It's wonderful to join you and to be included in the issue. Um, I'll be reading my poem from MER 21. And I'm thrilled to say that I'm in the divine design phase of my next book and that this poem is on the acknowledgments page so <laughs> and included in the collection. Words in body and stone. Needing proof of my survival, I tattoo rebellion in flesh, needle my mother's shame in ink. She also doubted her existence. A barb-wrapped shoulder, fist clenched, filled with a movie star kiss she tongued behind the moon, blue skies and a winged snake, self-doubt wrapped in cellophane. The bird on me has held her shape, and I retire to a garden of raised beds. Grasses break frames in eyeglasses, tomatoes green to yellow on the vine. Grieving in a field, the child I was is shot behind electric gates. He creates a simpler tattoo than my truth. In this resting place, I carve my explanations in the headstone of my choosing. I write, the body is a flight through sternum. Mary, mother's name, carved in rock and deltoid, letters mossed in her confusion. 
She looks for answers beyond pursed lips. Earth hemorrhages like a September, and we all share dark father with the light. Even now, a sun names my shadows in graphite. Beside the graves, the outline of my husband's hand, hieroglyph in relief, the long reach of his touch. Sometimes I whisper, hold me in his ear. I'm done with being human, chiseling lost hours, flaking skin, a prayer for ink to fly. Promises are washed away in sandstone. I've never kept a secret, even moms. Heirlooms planted, I let the legends rot in light. I have a spotless agate in my barn. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you for reading. Um, our next reader is Eileen Cleary. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you everyone at MER. I really appreciate you all so much. Um, melon decorators, hay growers, scarecrows, showbirds and market lambs compete at the county fair. In ancient times, an emperor disguised himself and escaped with his wife past a band of rebels by pushing her in a wooden ox. Here in Merced, a garden in a wheelbarrow blooms next to the tallest weeds. This is the same town where the child I mentioned was fast talked into a stranger's Buick. And while they sped toward oblivion, peach bags emptied into wooden crates and workers moved ladders to reach the unpicked treetops. I've been thinking about Merced's county fair and almost the way Miloche did Campo de Fury. For Milotes exiled near the Warsaw ghettos, it was the loneliness of dying. No one listened. For me, on this evening in June, 50 years after the boy climbed into his fate, it's that he'd never really be home. Even these thoughts travel alone. Thank you so much, Eileen. Our next reader is Ashley Cundiff. Thank you. Um, I'm Ashley Cundiff. I'm so happy to be included in this issue. Uh, my essay Thrive is what is in MER 21, um, but I'm actually going to read the end of another essay I wrote. Um, and I have an essay blog where I post a lot of smaller essays. So if you're interested in them, um, you can find that link in my bio. And this is from an essay called Wild Things, which is a reflection on Maurice Sendak's book from a parent's point of view. And this is just the last two paragraphs, the very end. Every morning I put on my wolf suit, coffee, and prepare to take on the wild things that are my three children. I begin by vowing that I will maintain control of the rumpus, which of course turns into chaos as those wild things I've created turn out to be autonomous and have minds of their own. Unfortunately for me, my exclamations of be still and now stop are less effective than Max's. And when I tire of the wild rumpus, sending my wild things to bed without their supper and sailing back to my own quiet room aren't exactly options. While the child Max imagines himself king of, of a world of ferocious beasts, my own imaginings of myself as the beneficent caretaker of children who enjoy quietly educating themselves with Montessori approved toys and picking up messes are decidedly tame, though just as fervently imagined. But once my children finally go to sleep and I've taken a moment to breathe and picked up a few toys before giving up and collapsing on the crumb strewn couch, I think of them fondly in the way that parents always think fondly of their sleeping children. I helped to create a world with them in it. And of course, in the way that living creations do, that world quickly got terribly and wildly out of hand. Yet how amazing to watch it go awry. They are me and not me. They are mine and not mine. They, like the beasts in the world Max creates, are both terrifying and beautiful. And once I've realized that the world I've created around them is now theirs to shape, all I can do is witness the rumpus, hope they'll be willing to sail back home in the end, and try to make sure that when they do, their suppers are still hot. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. 
Um, our next reader is Mary John Duckler. Thanks so much for having me. Still live with thrifted object. I feel an affinity for the objects many hands touched and one hand threw away. The discarded anniversary plate after the adversaries have commenced. Crafts and edges still cling relieved of duties, a jumble of unalike colored items that trash talk across areas what it was to be exalted. Even contraband was once up to some good. The piece of the past missed in the present frenzy, beauty in uselessness, how a thing needs to be moved to reveal a value, the value in what moved us first. I said to the dealer, look man, this glass, improbably whole after crazing and contagion, a mother once filled to satisfy a child's thirst. Thank you so much, Mary Dunn. That was lovely. Um, our next reader is Suzanne Edison. Hi, thank you. I'm also reading my poem that's in um, R21. It's called Etymological Buckle. In the book of word origins, I find to speed you on your way. My mother's voluminous cursive script parades diagonally down the page to speed from German, to succeed or prosper. Her prescient words laid down 30 years ago before I conceived this literary line, this lineage of work, reveal themselves when I discard the ripped dust jacket. Our discourse then, she listened as I bragged my knowledge of our mutual muse psyche the storms once buffeting, constraining our hearts and minds held a truce. Now my breath unbuckles, her blessing stands like a shield's boss, an omphalos begging me to align, bow to these tangled roots, even as they surprise and sequester loss. To lose, be deprived of, or cease to have. Learning to speak, I cinched and loosened my lips, repeated her words, hastening towards my mother tongue. Shoe, baby, door. And today I want more, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jen and Cindy and Marjorie. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Our next reader is Jennifer Edwards. Thank you, Jen, and thank you everyone at Mom Egg Review. Um, I've really just appreciated all your hard work and excellent writing that you guys gather through the year. So this issue is no exception. It's got some great writing in it. So thank you so much. I'm going to read a poem um, that's based off a similarly structured poem by Eduardo Corral that's in issue 21. Questions for my aging body. Is there a mixed drink you don't like? Why knock on the dollhouse door? Do you require medication? Can't you stop questioning? Is it that you don't want your kids to grow? Can you even imagine yourself as an old lady? Why does beauty sometimes scare you? Were you okay, even for a second, with hands on your neck? Why did you want someone else's husband? Can you read without a pen in your hand? Will you ever embrace technology? Why does your heart thump on interstates? Do you know, do you think that much, much of this was justified? Are you still jealous of your mom's fingernails? Why did your dad teach you ice fishing? How many funerals will you miss? Isn't that deer carrying a message? Why are you always using teeth? Thank you. Thank you, Jen, that was great. Um, our next reader is Kelly Engelbrecht. Hi, thank you so much, Jen, and thank you so much, Mom Egg Review. And I will say, as a new mother, 
having a space like this that celebrates and honors motherhood in all of its facets is incredibly meaningful. So thank you so much for providing that. I'll be reading a portion of a prose piece that is in issue 21 called House Poor Two. There is a thin, sharp line inside my mouth below my lip. When I put my finger in my mouth to press against the porous ridge, it smarts. My finger feels like a lump of chew tucked into the pocket of my lip. I like how bulbous my mouth looks, misshapen. I can't remember where the cut came from. Perhaps it's finally gum rot, but I pass hours rubbing my tongue on the tenderness where it stings until it feels good. In addition to sucking my cheek, she started putting her hands in my mouth. She lies on her side, suckling, a long stare into the wall, her arm extended, waving around until her hand finds the softness of my lips. She uncurls a fist and stuffs one by one her small fingers into the wet cavity of my mouth. Her nails graze my gums. She pulls down until my bottom teeth are exposed. A thread of saliva drips. The three of us lie in bed. I've curved my body in a soft arch against her as her gums search for my breast. The early morning static is hypnotic. She moves like molded jello, leading with her feet from side to side, grabs the pink skin next to my nipple before turning away to grab his stubble chin. We pretend to sleep, but my body feels too precise. A leg over a left leg so I can't roll over, an arm over an arm to barricade the pillow. In the softness of our center, she is finally still, arms outstretched, but I feel her looking into the exhalation of Dawn's first blush. The ocular let motif of day brushes against my suspended cage made of blood and spittle. I hold both and neither, specter and flesh. The bathroom door moans. It cries as it heaves itself shut, slowly lowering itself into the belly of a penny tiled floor. I wonder who has died here. Who has died here? What blood this house holds? What sweat licks the plaster walls? What cells layered underneath slabs? A house is wood and wall and roof and window, but also overstretched tendons and body odor and a can of old style left in the fridge and a Federal Express box from 1988. Is it an A-flat that slowly turns out of tune? The bathroom door, I mean? I remember the time that my mother sat in Gare de Bordeaux Saint-Jean until she figured out that the signal for an incoming train was a perfect fourth by singing, Here Comes the Bride, or was it Amazing Grace? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Okay, um, our, okay so our next reader is Brandel France de Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Jen. Just looking across my screen and for this amazing issue, I'm so honored to be included. So I'll read my prose poem from uh, the current issue from Mer 21. It's called Final Descent. After my mother died, I spent sunsets on the roof, scouring the clouds, white tea leaves in a drained and darkening cup. A few times I thought I sensed her up there, lingering, like the smell of her empty apartment, old paperbacks, tobacco, and Miss Dior. At once a disembodied ear and the domed auditorium. How must it feel to be perpetually traversed by smooth-talking planes, satellites that repeat the same old stories? I have no religion, and still I'm a sucker for assent. And yet the sky is not the only vastness. Listen, O oh drop, give yourself up without regret and in exchange gain the ocean. Why not a candle lit by other candles in a cathedral of roots or an orange blossom in the Alhambra of my heart? Call it failure of imagination, a reflexive craning towards the light. On top of our house by the airport, tracking a jet's descent, I imagine the passengers rehearsing for touchdown, what not to forget, who to call first, the psychic unbuckling. Another day that the door with glowing red letters did not open. The night she died, she called to say she couldn't breathe. I had just left her bedside after checking the plastic nozzles in her nose and kissing her goodnight. I'm dying, said the voice on the phone. 
If you're able to talk to me, you're still breathing, I laughed. And with that, she laughed too, her oxygen sliding down like a window shade before a long flight. Undimmed, immune to the sleeping pill's effects, she was more herself than she'd been in months. Terminal lucidity, they call it. Thank you. Thank you, Brandel. So Jen has passed the baton to me, Cindy Beach, and I'm really happy to be here. And I just want to echo what Jen said that uh, editing together, it's we we love to work together, Jen and I, and, and we love Murr. So it, it may be a labor of love, but it's one we love. And I'd say that every issue we've worked on together is a journey. It's an adventure and every issue is different. Um, and it's just really fun to see the personality of each issue as it emerges. So, um, so we're at the halfway point um, of the reading. Um, and our first reader in this half is Elizabeth Garcia. Is Elizabeth here? I am here. Thank you. Great. Um, I was going to read uh, the poem that's in this issue, but um, I kind of wanted to read something that expresses what I'm feeling right now three weeks into summer vacation uh, I don't know how many of you have school-aged kids but I kind of forget how to write like every summer <laughs> um, and I have been getting up early to do it this year because I finally have gotten to a point where they won't have this radar that comes to find me but it's still really hard um, so this is called Cotyledon to kill the time before dinner instead of them, I drag my kids to the park and watch them from a bench do what kids do. Run, the only way to live in the body, green their knees, stare brazen-eyed, graze on the words of other children, none strange, a word only for adults, their truth still chartreuse and capital. They climb, get stuck, the right of unsticking somehow belongs only to the first unsticker, the one whose birth canal they first burst through, you. But mostly, I try to read a book, recall how language once lived in me too, seedlings of vines reaching up for sunlight through my throat. It closes thick on knuckle bone, on stone, how many doors away am I from that goddess with the birthing tongue? I once spoke things into being. I once could listen. The trees are hissing, full of insect wings in the dusk. A crack, a glass shattering like a voice I know. My boy has tripped. She made me chase her, made me fall. Oh, agony. Oh, ancient Adam cursed. Here is my lap. Let us sit by the power derricks, chained to the horizon. Let us listen. Mommy, he says, you can hear the wires crackle. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, next we have Marie Gauthier. Um, is... Hi, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you're here. I'm not used to having to, I, I, I do webinars for work, but I stay muted the entire time. So <laughs> having to unmute myself suddenly made me panicky. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Cindy. And thank you, Jen. And thank you, Marjorie. I love Mom Egg Review. And I'm just thrilled to have been a part of it again. But I'm, I'm not reading my poem from you. I'm actually going to take this opportunity to read a brand new poem, which I don't get very often. So, and we are... We are barreling towards the end of the school year here. I have three school age kids and we're the, coming to the end of track season, which I happen to adore. So uh, this is called Personal Best. Mid-April hits hot. The sun drying crusts of salt on the runner's bodies as the track meet edges toward evening. There's no harboring shade, no leaves on the trees. Caregivers line the track in caps beneath umbrellas, 
clap and call our children's names, then glance at phones after they pass. It's the first meet of the season. We're not yet used to the cadence of contest, how jumping flows to throwing, flows to running, the purgatory of in-between. We're one in our well wishes for the last racer over the finish line. You got this, way to go. The air is cooled to 80 by the time the four by four starts, the sun behind the hills. The official's gun pops with a puff and the racers launch. Their batons catch the low light as the runners pump their arms and legs around the curve. Their teammates roar, go, go, let's go, while their bodies cut through the still hot air, reaching, reaching. We cry out when one fumbles the handoff, the thud of metal on polymer. The next runner snatches it up, bounds after the lost seconds, the lost ground. Our shouts fill the field, flout the inevitability of time and space, defeat but a temporary stop along the tangents. The air lifts with a breeze as they fly by. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Um, then we have Kate Lynn Hibbard. Hi. Um, thank you very much. I think this is such a great idea to have this reading. I wish every journal did this. So um, I have, when I was working on the poem that appears in the issue, it started as an essay, but I'm a terrible essayist. So it chopped it into two prose poems. And this is the other half. I am not Persephone, nor Demeter, though grief has taken me underground. Isn't every poet allowed to write at least one dead mother poem or 100? How many years before they stop coming? Your mother never stops being your mother. If you're lucky, at some point, your mother will become a person in addition to being the myth that is your mother. If you're lucky, at some point, your failed garden, failed relationship, failed metaphor will stop being your mother. I never stop thanking her. I never stop blaming her. I never stop marveling at the echoes of my mother grief. I never stop noticing I am now the age she was when she, when she lost my father, when she moved to the city, when she became a great grandmother, when she stopped cooking, when she stopped walking, when she stopped. I never stop atoning for my sins. I never stop wishing I had been kinder, forgiven more as I grow older and stand accused of the same things, of not making logical sense, of being obsessed with small details, how long until the milk expires, the names of particular trees, of giving too much, yet somehow giving too little. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, next, we have Livia Menigan. Hi, thank you to everyone at MER. And I'd like to specifically thank Caitlin, who just read before me, because I feel like my poem goes with that similarly on theme. So <laughs> for such a lightning round kind of reading, like I feel like that was serendipitous. <laughs> um, I just, uh, I have a short poem, the poem that's in the issue. And uh, my only little Easter egg for context is that when I reference a lion's tooth, that is kind of a hidden name for a dandelion, which comes from the French dent de lion, so lion's tooth. So that's why I mention a lion in this poem. <laughs> Elegy in waiting. Far into the woods, fallen logs, overgrown with fungi, thread-like and bright, die. And closer, Spider webs lie across the heights of violet lilacs, while early spring's tulips linger under high noon, not gone yet, still too soon. Inside, a bouquet's early bloom shies from wine-blue lights in a white room. 
Fighting by the back door, a woman tries to find a lion's tooth in a bowl of basil and thyme. Thank you. Thank you, Livia. Um, next, we have Gloria Monahan. Hi, everyone. And um, wow, the, these poems are truly amazing. It's it's incredible. I want to thank Marjorie and Cindy Beach and Jennifer Martelli for putting this together. It makes me feel so much better. <laughs> All uh, right, <laughs> yeah. Um, so mine's short too. Um, <clears throat> I've been working on these um, everyday poems about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. This is called Saturday's Child Works Hard for a Living. After these ancient ideas of what you were born under, what day you were born under, and that would somehow predetermine your fate. Saturday's child works hard for a living. Shoveling the snow, a robin spoke to me in the blizzard. Her rounded and tufted body told me of her possible pregnancy and suffering. Snow sat heavy in the pine. My mind drifted into a space of non-thought like a knight on the road, on his horse sleeping and dreaming of nothing, a red cross on his right shoulder. And I will say that I stole those two lines from a troubadour poet and I, two of my students are here tonight and I thank them for being here. So I want them to know that every exercise I give them, I, I do myself to see if it's arduous or um, what the challenges might be. So I stole, um, my mind drifted into a space of non-thought like a night on the road. I was just thinking about being in between sleep and awareness. So thank you everyone. And thank God for this press. <laughs> thank you, Gloria. Uh, next, we have Dana Patterson. Thank you. Um, I've loved the poems. They've all been amazing in prose excerpts. And thank you, Cindy and Jennifer and Marjorie. I've been a huge fan of Mom Egg Review for a long time. I appreciate all you do. It's a wonderful space. I echo Kelly. Like, thank you for making this space for literature about mothers and motherhood. And um, I'm going to read a poem that is adjacent to... Uh, the poem that appears in issue 21. It is another poem that is riffing on motherhood and Shakespeare, bringing those two together. Um, the poem that appears in Mer 21 is about Gertrude, um, Hamlet's mother, and this one is riffing on uh, Lady Macbeth. It's called Red Handed. Chopping beets for borscht, my daughter, do I look like a murderer? shoves her ruddied hands in my face. I pull one of her hairs from my mouth, dyed red from beet juice swirling in my bowl, gold beads of chicken fat in the broth, her hair in my mouth, reminding me who made this meal, this sustenance. This girl I grew from my beet red womb after pills, procedures, files of blood, the hysterosalpingogram, when dye bloomed from each fallopian tube, a poisonous flower spelling dead end. Each month, its petals shed bright drops in the shower, scrawling failure. How she sustains me hour to hour, a beat is not a tuber, but a taproot that grows heart-shaped. She at seven weeks, seven millimeters, no bigger than a bean. Her pinhead heart flaring on screen, a bright jolt. A beet's rich scarlet derives from pigments called betalanes, 
and I a kind of accomplice to the crime called mother, as in my body gutted, and the I I was became carcass. Who else can I call murderer? But she made me host and hostage. A beet seed is tiny as a grain of sand. It grows round and bulbous in the dark. I went willingly, but witness, she was red-handed from the start, guilty when I ousted her, the evidence plain to see, her flailing on my chest, her hands, small blades, cut open the blue veins of sky, the sun bled and bled, crimson streaked, her hands, vernix creased, her hands chopped the air as if to say, all of this, all of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, next, we have Jennifer Pons. Hi there. Thank you. Um, and thank you. I, I'm echoing what everyone has said, but thank you so much. Uh, Mom Egg, it's such an amazing honor to read with all of these readers. That's incredibly impressive. Thank you all. Um, this poem is from issue 21, but it's in its, I'll call it its second iteration. Uh, so it, it did a little, uh, little tiny mutations. Mother of the Reluctant, at 14, my mother boarded a bus to Minneapolis with $50 and a lunch. She arrived at a stranger's home to buy an abortion kit and a paper sack for her mother. My grandmother and mother were both named Mary. Both had green eyes and smiled wide. I have green eyes too. At first, my stepmother's name was also Mary, though she changed her name to become someone else she came to know living inside her body. Once she lost a baby. She told me the story many times. She wanted not to live. My stepmother said she crossed over and back again in new skin with a new God. I imagine her drowning in a river, then flipping her body like a salmon with an instinct to jump past the surface, ridding her scales of sea lice. I was a reminder of my mother who was like sea lice. My stepmother was a lot like a lost baby. I too long for a new body in a mountain river. How does one escape inside her skin? How does one repair the naming of her body? The naming of us is a mistake. Who can sort the mother parts? How is one supposed to do this? The Marys didn't want to, but I am not the Marys and cannot fit inside a paper sack or a river. No woman can be mother to the shells, mother to bus riders. Mother to green, I needed Mary the girl who wanted to be mother of the lonely, mother of fish, mother of lice, mother of escape. I needed a mother before I became a mother. Some mothers arrive without knowing, some mothers refuse, some say to the violas spreading in their gardens, I am not a good mother. Some grieve the dying salmon and dead babies inside. Still, others wear the shape of mother, body shaping the babies who are to become the bearers of shells and scales. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, next is Kyle Potvin. I, I mean, I was enamored by these poems on the page, and now to hear them in your voices is just incredible. Um, thank you so much, Marjorie and Cindy and Jen, for putting this all together. Um, I am going to read from um, my poem that's in this issue. 
uh, for all the graduates. Upon leaving, as written in the book of Squirrel. If you insist on exploring the heavy forests to the east or the homesteads of the south, then travel quickly, directly. Do not stutter in your opening salvo of leaving. You think you can turn back, don't try. I have ventured across wider streets than this. Here I am, others who tried are not. There are hawks, snakes and foxes and other things that crush a body and spirit. But if you stay, you will be stifled by the monotony of limbs. I am too old to leave this place where I know every bud and berry. But you, I see your tail twitch with greed for the land you glimpse but have yet to reach. My little kit, once I carried you blind for months and now, but this is not a story of millennia. This is only yours. Someone once scoffed at my dream of joining a different scurry. I went anyway, as you must. Go, nest in the crook of branches, bury what you need for the cold days ahead. One day you will remember what you need and dig. Travel light, remember how I taught you speed, distance, focus. Eyes ahead, light does not always illuminate. Better to trust yourself in the black of night. Locate a fragrant nut on the other side and run, run for your life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, next is Kimberly Priest. Hello. I am also grateful for the space this journal creates. Um, I raised my two children to adulthood through a long-term domestic violence situation. And um, I'm happy to say that my son, who's featured in this poem, is now um, a wonderful and tender young man. Uh, and he and his partner have just recently made me a grandmother. So I have double mothering to celebrate now. So this is the poem that is in uh, Mom Egg. How to forgive the predator. All living things must eat. The stomach is not impartial, neither the soul. We survive by what we do and do not nurture, and sometimes this requires teeth. I say to my son, don't incise the soft part of your heart, but he does creating a scar, each time toughening, each time making the tissue less susceptible to pain. When I got divorced, I learned quickly that this is what made me desirable for eating, having been broken down by a mallet, my husband's hammering anger tenderizing me, having forgotten pain, having learned not to squeal in a cage, but continue to release the lactic acid that keeps the slaughter from spoiling. My son teaches himself to forget pain too, in the same house, on the same street, with the same sort of fleshly craving, a little indifference to break down his appetite for love. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, next, um, Jessica Purdy. Hello. Uh, reiterating what everyone is saying, this is amazing. Thank you so much for uh, including me in this reading and in this issue. I'm gonna read my poem from the issue called Visitor. I can hear the tree workers next door chainsawing the old limbs. Even the shower can't drown it out. 
I stay in extra long. Today, I need to burn the cold out of me. There's this knot in my throat as if I'm pine wood. There's this failing that can't be swallowed. I've been remembering old facts of my childhood, things that haven't stayed in fashion, crocheted ponchos, my mother's punch bowl and a ladle for serving, the bunt pan ice disc floating like a lifesaver in a miniature pool, the sweet bubbles she concocted. I'm looking at my daughter's chaotic bedroom, thinking I could make it into art. Her body I'm responsible for assembling is neat as a pin. Sharp contrast to her crumpled clothing mixed in with garbage. How she numbs herself against the knife edge of life. I'm remembering my father rolling a newspaper and lighting the kindling in the fireplace. His shoehorn and tin of brown kiwi shoe polish. His tie collection. My mom's grid method for transferring an image. Carbon paper. Her green speckled case of pencils. I'm an... Im <laughs> I'm imagining what a good parent does these days. I turn away from the mildewed ceiling, let the hot water pelt my eyes. Wonder why this balled up fist showed up today on the doorstep of my throat. I recognize the feeling, its fingerprints clenched, a fist inside like a tree's concentric rings. Thank you, Jessica. So we have our lat, we're at our last reader, um, believe it or not. And that is Pramila Venkatswar Warren. And I apologize, Pramila, if I did not pronounce your name correctly. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Marjorie and Jennifer. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. My poem is called Women for Women. We are staying right here. We are not leaving, even if planes are waiting to carry us to a different country. Why would we leave uncertainty to a different uncertainty? You say we will be killed here. Our lives have always been precarious. A falling star was no falling star, for we became ash. If we escape, who will support the women who depend on us? The girls whose dreams are just beginning to sprout? In this gnarled land of brown mountains and houses pockmarked with bullets, we are ships, our shawls buffeted by winds. We've tasted iron and felt coarse voices of authority sandpaper our skin. Rules knife us into obedience. Maybe we know what to expect, or perhaps we don't, when we step into violent light. We know our place is to make space for our sisters, mothers, daughters, even if it means breathing our last breath. Our terms go unheard. Our knell sounds clearly across our land, our beautiful, relentless Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramala. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Beautiful. Wow is, wow is absolutely right. Thank you so much to our wonderful readers. 